Okay, so Ephesians chapter 4, and reading from verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he, descended on, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Well, we've been considering the church and its call to unity. And it would be right to say, really, that a church that is seen and noted for its loving unity has to be one of the most precious sites this side of eternity in this current age that we live in. Because, of course, we have a world that is all around us in turmoil. And yet there is a church that is called to display this loving unity. Not just to display it as some kind of facade, but to actually be uh, the reality of the very heart, beat even we might say, of the body itself. It is a church in loving unity, is a reflection of that which is to come, of the world that is to come, the age that is to come. And therefore for this world now, when the world looks and sees a church displaying that love and that unity, that is a great testimony to this world that cannot hold on to such unity for very long because of the darkness of sin and iniquity. The church displaying loving unity is a visible image. A bit like Ezekiel when he was at the Kibar River and he saw incredible things and he saw ange angelic ho the angelic host as it were and he saw things that really it's hard for him to describe and it's harder still for us to understand but then at the very end of chapter 1 of Ezekiel he describes this majestic being and the splendour that he sees and we're told that this was an appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. It wasn't actually the glory of God itself that Ezekiel was seeing. It was the likeness of the glory of God. And we might even go further and say, it wasn't even God, it was the glory of God, as it were. A bit like you see the, the sun. You don't see the sun necessarily. You know, you're looking down and you see the effects of the sun. You see the splendor of the sun. And so it is with the church. When the church displays love and unity, it reflects, ultimately, the unity within the Godhead itself. And those are some of the things that we've been considering as we've been looking at the first few verses in this particular chapter. And this morning I wanted to introduce... Although, as I said before, it may be that for a few weeks we, we might leave it there and then come back to it later, but we'll see. But this morning I wanted to introduce verse, verses 11 to 13. So let's just read it again. It was he, talking of Christ, the ascended Christ. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, 
some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now when it comes to the individual Christian, and the individual Christian, therefore, who has been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, through his death, we can say that that love that God the Father has for us, and the fact that we are precious to him, so precious that he sent his son to die for us, that in God's sight, each individual Christian is equal in terms of the preciousness of that person to God himself. 1 Peter, sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1 and the very first verse. Let me read it to you as it is literally. You can read it in the NIV. It's not um, too different, but listen to how it reads in the literal translation. Peter is writing and he's writing to those equally precious with us, having obtained faith in the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To those equally precious with us. Now, if you and I were looking at these things, naturally we would say, well, Peter, of course, and Paul as well, they, they were... Well, all people are equal, but some are more equal than others. And, and Paul and Peter were more equal. Paul and Peter, surely, were more precious. And John must be even more precious, because he's the one who seemed to be so near and dear to Christ when he walked the earth. And so we might naturally think that some are more precious to God than others. But we're not. All are equal. All of us are precious in God's sight. Yet when we look at the family of God, we see, and I've already mentioned three names, Paul, Peter and John. We see that some are raised higher than others when it comes to position and when it comes to office in the church. Some are raised higher than others. And this is not down to the individual. I'm going to make myself a so-and-so in the church. I'm going to become a this in the church. It's not down to the individual. This is all of Christ. And we've seen that in looking at the verses previously. And looking at verse 7. Each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. It's Christ who does these things. And now in verse 11, it was he, Christ, who gave some to be apostles and etc. It's all of Christ. And that's enough to the halt. And it's enough to give us material to deal with one side of pride. And one side of jealousy. Oh, look at me. I'm at the front. That deals with that, doesn't it? It deals with that. Because if you are at the front, you're only at the front, if you want to call it the front, you're only at the front because Christ has put you there. And if all you're displaying is pride in that, the one who put you there can remove you just as easily. In fact, probably even easier. It's quicker to be removed, isn't it? It's quicker to fall than to rise up as it were. And the person who is jealous of one who's been raised up in the church has no reason to be, has no ground to be. Because it's Christ who says. It's not down to the individual. It is Christ. But then of course the other side of that is that. Well why not me then? Why not me? Why, I, why haven't I been called to such a position? Or the flip side of that is. <laughs> I must be special in Christ's eyes. Because he's called me to this particular position. 
Well, these worldly traits, they're not the mark of a Christian, are they? Yet, it doesn't mean that you can't be a Christian if you struggle with pride and with jealousy. But you must struggle with it. You mustn't let it get a foothold. You must seek to deal with it. Those former things, because these are the traits of the world, those former traits, they're to be left at the door, aren't they? A bit like someone who's got muddy boots, and they come to the house and the doors are opened, and there's white carpets there. You take your boots off, and you leave them outside. And that is what we're to do with such things as pride and as jealousy. But of course, people like the spectacular. Most people would rather be a firework than a sparkler. Because a firework is seen by all. And it draws all the oohs, ahs. Whereas a sparkler just gives pleasure to one individual. And it's only seen by those immediately around them. If you read, here we have a list, and it's not an exhaustive list, but you have a list of some of the, uh, the key offices in the church. And this is repeated elsewhere, or a list is given elsewhere. But if you read the list, and you can now if you want to, but I'm not going to. If you read the list in Romans chapter 12 and verses 6 to 8, an interesting thing to ponder. Because we like the spectacular, we want to be fireworks. An interesting thing to ponder in Romans chapter 12 and verses 6 to 8. Which one of those giftings would be the best? Would be the most glorious in God's sight? The gifts that are given by God are not for personal prestige. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 4 to 11 has a great list of gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit to individual believers. But these gifts given to the individual believers, are not for their personal prestige. Look at me. They're not for their personal prestige. They are given for the individual to minister to the whole, to minister to the body. But here, in the passage we're looking at in Ephesians, again we're dealing with giftings, But here the emphasis changes. In 1 Corinthians 12, what we're reading of there is the Holy Spirit gifting individuals to bless the whole. Here the emphasis changes. The gift in Ephesians, or the gifts spoken of in Ephesians, are not so much for the individual, i.e. given to the individual, but they're given to the church. Here, remarkably, the gifts spoken of are persons. Persons themselves. It was he who gave some. It was he who gave some persons. He gave to the church this person. And that person, who was it? Well, apostles. It was a Paul, it was a John, it was a Peter, and etc. It was he who gave gifts to the church. He gave Paul as a gift to the church. And what a gift he was. Here, Christ is the giver of the gift. But he's not giving the gift to the individual. He's giving the gift of an individual to The church. And we read in verse 8, the last part, having ascended on high, leading captives in his train, he gave gifts to men. Gifts to men. Apostles. 
evangelists, teachers and so on. Given by the ascended Christ to the Lord's people. And of course these gifts that he gave, they are the fruit of his ministry. They are the trophies of his triumph, of his conquest that he gives to the church for the building up of the church. He gives these to enable the church to function and to develop. So we can say that Christ gave gifts to the church to encourage the church and to build the church. Christ gave to the church Paul, the apostle, who was probably the greatest teacher the world has ever known save for the Saviour himself. The Lord gave to us Paul, who not only was he the greatest teacher, but what a writer. Not only what a writer, but what an evangelist. Not only what an evangelist, but what a worker. Tireless in his zeal. What a great example of zealous work and service to the church. And that that example was followed by others. You only have to flip the page of your Bible to the start of Philippians. And to Philippians chapter 1. Where you see that in verse uh, 12 he says, I want you to know brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He's in chains, but he says, as a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. So that's a witness to the world, but what about the church? Well, because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. You see, these gifts are given by the church. Why? Verse 12, back to Ephesians 4. To prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. And when we think of Paul, we can think of his writings, we can think of his teaching, we can think of his example. We can think of oh so much more besides. And under the blessing of the Holy Spirit, such an apostle as Paul encouraged, built up the church, instructed the church, but actually gave the church, in a sense, the zeal to want to go and do exactly what Paul was doing. Never mind the chains. Never mind the suffering. His example was infectious. And so he says to the Corinthian church, he says, follow my example. As I follow the example of Christ. What a thing to be able, what a thing to have someone say of you. You want to follow that brother's example. Because he follows the example of Christ. What a thing to have said of you. But what a thing to be able to say of yourself. Now if I said it, it would be untrue. To a large measure. But if I said it as well, you could be sure that there would be an element of pride in my saying it. And yet Paul, when he says it, he means it. And away with pride. It doesn't mean to say he didn't have those struggles. He did. A thorn was given him, wasn't it? To buffet him. Because of the incredible encounters he was having. The incredible experiences he was having and so on. But what I want to say this morning then is that. If the gifts. Are not for the individual. But for the church. Well then. Firstly the gifts. As in the persons given. By Christ. The gifts. Should be regarded as special. If the gifts are not for the individual, but for the church, then we need to encourage one another. We need to encourage the church to seek the giver of the gifts. And we also need to recognise our need for preeminent gifts today. And all of this should result in praise to the giver. So let's consider first of all that the gifts should be regarded as special. If you had someone who loved you, 
And they gave you a gift. A very special gift. You would cherish it, wouldn't you? You wouldn't just discard it. You wouldn't just chuck it on the floor. You would treat it with care. If it was something that was of use, you would use it carefully. I've had too many watches in my life to know that it's so easy to go bash. To know that it's so easy to do things with a watch on that can damage it. This watch was bought for a special birthday for me this year. And so therefore, it's special. Because it was bought by a special person for me. And so this watch, I don't wear for everyday use. I don't wear it when I'm going to be doing some building work. If ever I do any building work. <laughs> I don't wear it when I'm going to do gardening. <laughs> oh dear, holding, opening up here. <laughs> I don't work it when I'm doing trivial things like that, as it were. You know, when I'm doing the things where it could get damaged. I take care of it. But in a similar way, should not the church look after those whom the Lord has given to us? Because those whom the Lord gives us to serve amongst us, to give us an example, hopefully of Christ likeness, but certainly to teach us, certainly to lead us and to guide us. We might call them under shepherds. They are tokens of his love, given to us for our aid. Don't say the obvious thought that's in your mind, because every time I've looked at those words I've got down there in preparing this, he can't love us much then when he gives us to you. <laughs> that's the thought that's in my mind. But leaving that aside, we only have to look at pastorless churches today, the many pastorless churches today, to realise that having a pastor, however mediocre that pastor may be, having a pastor is a gift. It's actually a blessing from Christ. Because there may be churches far better than ours, far bigger than ours, far uh, richer spiritually than ours, but if they don't have a pastor, they haven't got that gift that Christ, in a sense, has promised promised to build his church and the way in which he does so is through these offices isn't it and so such a gift is a blessing from Christ the Lord constantly watches his gift or his gifts to the church or to the churches he's constantly watching them unlike your loved one who gave you the gift, here we are, it's a watch, let's say. You know, they, they might ask how it is from time to time. Is it still working? Has the battery run out yet? Or whatever. But once that gift is given to you, it's for you. And you alone. Whereas when it comes to Christ, he watches over his gifts. And he's constantly seeking to develop, seeking to improve them. Seeking to make them a better instrument, a better tool for his use. And so he continues to develop, even as he continues to de develop each and every one of us. And if you or I, if we have a problem with our gift, with a gift that the Lord has given to us, what should we do? I would suggest in the first instance, we take that to the Lord in prayer. We take it to the Lord in prayer. And we pray that we might get the most benefit from the gift. And that if there's a fault in the, in the gift, as it were, well, maybe sometimes we have to go to the person, don't we? If there's a fault in them, if they've wronged us in some way, we have to um, speak to them gently, as it were, about that. But that aside... If there are things, if there are characteristics, or if there are ways that are uh, obnoxious to you or whatever, then that is something we take to the Lord. We ask that the Lord would help us to deal with that. Maybe to change that gift in some way, transform them in some way. But we must pray that we would benefit from the gift. And I would suggest that here this morning, we as a church, we need to pray very much 
And I'll extend it now rather than, I know it, the list doesn't include deacons, but very much for the deacons of our church, very much for the pastor of our church, and indeed for all in our various responsibilities in this church, whatever that responsibility may be. And I'll just give one example. I cannot play a keyboard for love or money. The fact that Guineva can, week after week, just receive hymn numbers there and start to play them and then you can put your hand up and, you know it's, it's a gift isn't it which is a gift to the church in doing that and I know this isn't directly as I say talking about that kind of thing but we can extend it to that praise God, praise Christ for all his gifts to this church and pray for all of us in various responsibilities that we all be strengthened that we're better able to serve so that the body of Christ may be built up. Then we consider the gifts are not for the individual, they're for the church. We want to consider that we need to encourage ourselves. We need to challenge ourselves to seek the giver. I would encourage you this morning to seek the giver of the gifts. To seek Christ. And here I'm not talking about seeking in terms of your, your general walk with him. That's another side. But in terms of the Christ would endow, endow our church with greater gifts. With more gifts. That the gifts or gift that he's given to us would be greatly improved. To the betterment of the church as a whole. But you see, one of the big problems today is that many churches, not just in our land, but in many lands, but I'm thinking of our land, one of the big problems today is that the churches often are too much like the world. Now that we can look at, and that's a big subject, and you can look at it in all sorts of different ways. But here I'm thinking about the calling to ministry, or the role of a pastor, in many churches, it is considered a job. A job. Just like our brother will get up Wednesday morning. Tuesday, sorry to remind you of it, but <laughs> he will get up early Tuesday morning. You'll get up early tomorrow morning, no doubt. And, you know, off to work. You have your job. And sometimes we talk of that in terms of a calling. But when it comes to the pastor, the role of a pastor, it's not a job in the ordinary sense. And yet many churches will consider it in that way. They need a pastor. They're looking for a pastor, so they seek the pastor like an employer would seek a worker to do a certain job. And I noticed in a, a reputable Christian newspaper only this month that there is a certain church and they are advertising for a pastor. And what they are asking for is, well, all these different qualities they're looking for and etc. But they're saying, you will have a three-year contract. Which is renewable. Depending. A three-year contract. That, to me, is smacks of the way the world goes about things. Where... In that three-year contract is trust. What happened to trust? What happened to the... There's the man whom the Lord has called. There's the man whom the Lord has said, he is to be the one. And to trust in the Lord and to seek the Lord in this and to prayerfully appoint that man. Where is the welding together to the body? Where's the welding to the body? Where's the man giving himself fully to... Could you give yourself fully to a church where you knew you'd got three years? Three years to get results. And what are results? Do you know, in those three years, I've grown so incredibly as a Christian. The ministry of our minister has been so fantastic. Praise God for that. But why aren't we renewing his contract? Well, we're not renewing his contract because although you feel you've grown spiritually... There's too many empty spaces. We haven't had the numbers coming in we thought we would get. That's how 
many people will go about these things. That's how success is often considered, isn't it? The person coming and giving himself fully to the body, fully to the church. Maybe he's been within the church, maybe he's been raised in the church. Well, if he's been raised in the church, in a sense it's easier because he's already part and parcel of the church. But if he's been called in outside, hmm, you're a bit strange, you're a bit unfamiliar. You know, you, you've got to get to know one another, haven't you? And in a way, it starts off a bit like a blind date, doesn't it? But what happens is, the man must give himself completely to the church. And the church must give itself completely to the man. That's how it should be. Instead, the man has signed his three-year contract. Because he's, he's on a ladder. It's a career move. And what he's hoping is that that big church in the city, that they might see what he's been up to. That he might get called there. So that when the three years are up, just like the striker for the big football team, he can wave goodbye. And he can go to his bigger calling. That's how some people And I would suggest it's driven that way by this kind of mentality of seeking a pastor as an employer would a worker. So many pastors would look at it in that way as a career move. And yet there's a man, as an example, and I I can't remember now where I read this, so I, I can't give you the accurate reference, but I think it might have been William Grimshaw. But I'm not entirely sure, but there was a man and he was called of God into the ministry. And there he was pastoring the church. And he was there for many years. And the Lord blessed that church. And yes, there were more people coming in. But he blessed the church spiritually as well. So that those who were in were being built up. So that this verse was actually happening there. That the body of Christ was built up. They were reaching a unity in the faith. And then he had a call to a big city church. To London. And prayerfully, and taking much time over it, much heart-wrenching, he accepted. And it came to the last Sunday morning, where he was to say goodbye to his flock. And this was somewhere up north, and if it was Grimshaw, obviously it was Yorkshire. I don't now think it was Grimshaw, uh, Grimshaw. I think it was someone else. But anyway, by the by, the last morning, he was to preach and he was to say his farewell. And he broke down. And he wept so much. And they wept with him. He was so moved. They were so moved. That he could not bring himself to leave them. You see the two had become one. It was like a marriage. He was welded to them. And though he'd been called in from outside. And whether he thought this is where I'll die or not. I don't know. But he could not leave. And so it was decided. He wouldn't go. And he stayed with the church stay with the church. Now that doesn't mean to say that to go is wrong. There are times when the Lord calls, well I say there are times, if the Lord calls you, you go, don't you? And sometimes that can be heart-wrenching. When I left Grace School, the Christian school, as a teacher, it's heart-wrenching. I tried to tell them, uh, we had the, the kind of big send-off and all the parents were there and everything, and I wasn't worried about that, it was the children I was going to miss. And I turned to the children, I ignored all the parents, I turned to the children and I started telling them about a story of uh, Mr. Goodbye Mr. Chips. And I couldn't finish it because I broke down and I had to leave. It was so heart-wrenching. So heart-wrenching. But then people say, yes, but we've seen. And we've had someone in our church and it all went wrong. We've seen many churches where it goes wrong. We've called a man. We've known of churches. They've called a man. And oh dear, it's been a disaster. We don't want to make ourselves vulnerable again. We've been hurt before. We don't think it's right to face or to put people through that kind of trial. There would be a bad testimony as well. So it's not a bad idea to give someone a a six month trial. Or just to get them to sign a one year contract or a three year contract. And then, if things work out, then yeah, we can give them a contract for life. 
Jesus, he went on a mountainside to pray. And he spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he designated apostles. It doesn't go on to say he got them to sign a six-month contract. It does not say that. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders in each church and with prayer and with fasting they committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. There was no contract, no sign here. But you know, for many, many churches, prayer is merely a part of the process of appointing a pastor. It's something that you do because it's the right thing to do. So, you know, they're, they're, maybe there's an elder there and they're saying, look, come on, we need to pray more and pray for a pastor and so on. So, yes, that's part of the process. But for Christ, it was key. He spent the night on the mountain praying before he appointed 12 disciples whom he designated apostles. Paul and Barnabas, so serious was it that they let their stomachs rumble for I don't know how long. Because they wanted to know the will of Christ who is the giver of the gift. They did not need contract. And indeed what is not needed today is not a contract. What is needed is wisdom and the discernment. Discernment and wisdom and the Lord's will in the matter. And that takes much prayer, doesn't it? Now it's not that I'm here this morning and this is, I've spent a long time with this, it's not that I'm here to make a big statement that I'm against contracts and people shouldn't sign a contract. What I'm against is caution just in case. That's what I'm against. I'm against that. To do it as a commitment. Well, that's a great thing, isn't it? You know, you often hear of churches who they draw up a covenant. Where they commit certain things to one another. Or whatever. They, they commit their future in a certain way to one another. I don't know. Seeking to be diligent to pray for one another and so on. Whatever it is. And they draw up a covenant. They actually write it down. And it's not unknown for the whole church to sign that. It's not known for a pastor to, to sign a contract to say, I will be your pastor. But it's done as a commitment. A commitment of devotion. That this is me giving myself for you. Not in case anything goes wrong, then we can nab you. It is Christ who gives the gifts to his church. And we might start... I say that universally. The church might start by seeking him. Start by seeking him and finish by seeking him. It's the Lord who does this, not us. And then we come thirdly to our need for such gifts today. Now, as I say, I'm just looking at this in a general way this morning. Not going in to look at the individual names that are given here as evangelists and pastors and teachers and so on. But our need for gifts Today, this is how Christ builds his church. He's promised to build his church. And this is how Christ builds his church. Not that uh, the pastor or you appoint an evangelist and he does it all. You have someone who's a schools worker and that's all the children taken care of or, or whatever. It's not like that. What we read here is that the person whom Christ gives to the church or the persons whom Christ gives to the church they are there to prepare God's people for works of service so we all muck in we all get involved the church is built up together not just built up in our head knowledge that we trust and hope goes to our heart but yes it's built up in that way but also that we serve we serve actively in seeking to promote Christ in our workplaces, in our homes, in our families, and so on. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm talking to the youngest people here today, but it could be. 
But, you know, maybe there's someone here, or maybe, maybe you have some kind of sense of call. Maybe sense of call to ministry. If you feel that in any way. There's a sense in which, I remember someone saying to me one time, when I first voiced that, someone saying, really that should be in every Christian. I said, when I first became a Christian, I, I, straight away, it kind of came with that. But I, I, wanna, I, I couldn't see the point in carrying on life the way it was. Now I knew what it was all about. I couldn't see the nine to five and, and it didn't make any sense to me anymore. Doing just that, and it's not to knock that, but that, I'm just trying to be honest, that's how it felt. What's the point of carrying on as I am when I know this? I need to be telling people. And I've been a pretty poor uh, example of telling people, I have to say, but it, that was there. And this person who I put it to as a pastor, he said, there's a sense in which every one of us should feel that. Every one of us should feel that we want to throw everything in and just go and be a... I don't know, a travelling evangelist or something. A missionary. Just speaking about Christ. Do you feel that? Have you felt that? Surely you have. If you know him, you must have. But it's something that... If it's something that you have as as a consideration, it's something that really does warrant, indeed demand... And I would say Christ, in a sense, commands it. Most serious prayer as to the Lord's leading, as to the Lord's guiding in him. I know a man who always doubted his own call to ministry. And the reason he doubted it, it's a Christmas thing going on. <laughs> Sorry. The reason he doubted it was because it wasn't the church that had said, this man, this man is called. It was the individual himself. And one or two other people, and he may well have had that call. But because it hadn't been gone about in what I would say would be the most appropriate way, and there are other reasons for that as well, it led to this, that there he was in ministry. And doubting most days whether he was really called to it. Yeah, he was a fantastic preacher. But he doubted most days he was called to it. Why? Well, because he didn't have the backing of a church to have said, Brother, go and preach. We're sending you out with prayer and fasting as Paul and Barnabas did. We're sending you out. He went of his own volition. And under the advice of one or two others. And so it was easy for the devil to come and say, You? Particularly after he preached well. Nah, you're not called. You're not called. It's something we... We should never go into anything lightly, should we? We should never take a job lightly. We should never move house lightly. We should never do anything like that in a light way. Everything should be bathed in prayer. But how much more so when we come to a calling to ministry? A calling which has been described by someone who was a very preeminent surgeon as the highest calling. The highest calling. Demands the highest prayer, doesn't it? Then, of course, for the person who is called, what a daunting thought for that minister. I'm a gift of Christ to a church. You know, it's one that, in a sense, should leave you speechless. One that should leave you scratching your head, exasperated. But one as well, because we consider that those who are in that position, much more is demanding of them. It should fill you with terror. And there are times when it does. For me, more often than not, it fills me with, well, just makes me want to scratch my head and think, why me? Why me? And I don't say that in any flippant way. And I'm not saying that to get humour from you or anything. I mean it. I can't... Martin Lloyd-Jones said he wouldn't cross over the road to hear himself preach. But if he wouldn't cross over the road to hear himself preach, if I'm being honest, what what can I say? And yet you're sitting here today. (laughs) Rafe Wickham worked for the Foreign Office during the 1930s. 
And he was alarmed. He was alarmed by reports that were coming into his office about Nazi Germany. And the fact that they were, it seemed all too clear, beginning to rearm during the 1930s. But no matter who he spoke to, no one would listen. No one would listen to what he had to say. No one would look at the evidence that was there. What he needed was a voice. A voice who would cause the government and the people of the nation to sit up and take notice. Today, what the church needs is a voice. A voice who will cause the people of this nation to sit up and to take notice. We're not talking now about a foreign power. We're not even talking now about a terrorist bomb. We're talking about something that will still be here threatening and undermining the world when Al-Qaeda, ISIS and any other terror organisation have long gone. An organisation that will be here until the very end of the age. That is all the demonic forces of hell. And the message and the voice that needs to be uttered, the message it needs to be uttering, is not just of the state of this land, but of the coming judgment that will be upon this world, upon this nation. A voice to speak out. Winston Churchill was the voice for Rafe Wiggle. He was the voice. And he stood in the house and he said, let me tell you about what is going on in Germany today. And a heckler, as they like to heckle, don't they, in the House of the Parliament, a heckler shouted out, sit down, Winston, we've heard it all before. Ah, what they'd heard before. Was Winston merely voicing his concerns? But now what he had in his hands, at his disposal, disposal were the facts. Because Rafe Wigman had supplied them to him. And so he was able to say, this you won't have heard before. I can assure you of that. And he began to tell them about what was literally going on in Germany about the rearmament, about the fact that they were building aircraft, but they weren't doing it in one place. They were building different parts in different factories across the German nation, and then they were bringing them to one place, a new town, that had suddenly exploded overnight to assemble these aircraft. And as fact upon fact upon fact was given to them, the house became still. The house became silent. And one or two, at last, began to sit up and take notice. And then the story goes on, doesn't it? Because a year went by. Another year came. Things got worse and worse in Nazi Germany. And they started to do the things that you know they started to do. And Churchill's voice was booming out more and more. And people finally started to listen. The whole nation was awakened from their slumber. Many people today speak in our churches. And it's very easy to speak and say about the terrible things in the nation and so on. Many people do that in our churches. And many people perhaps do it outside the churches. Many people probably try to tell the nation as it were. But no one will listen. What do we need? What we need is a voice. But not just an ordinary voice, because here's an ordinary voice. What we need is an exceptional gift from Christ to the church of our land. 
I was going to say what we need is a Luther. But I don't think we need a Luther. Because a Luther was sent to reform the church. And yes, there's always things wrong with the church. And yes, the church needs a kind of reformation. But in the days that Luther was raised up, the church held sway over the people. And everyone was following its dictates. Today we have many churches that have the truth. What we don't have is a voice of power to proclaim that truth. And with the power of another person who can make that voice echo and echo and echo in the heart of the hearer. The kind of voice we need is none other than a George Whitfield. That's the kind of person we need. Or if you've never heard of George Whitfield, I would say we need an Apostle Paul in his evangelistic zeal. That's what we need. And the power that we need, that other person I mentioned, the Holy Spirit. That's what we need today in our nation. An exceptional gift, a Whitfield. To save our nation from the abyss. And that calls for each one of us to be very diligent and very persistent in our prayer. On Thursday evening at our prayer meeting, we briefly considered that prayer, or not the prayer, the, um, the, the persistent widow who went to the judge's house and kept knocking and saying, give me justice, give me justice. And he didn't want to do it, but because she kept persisting, it wasn't because he had any fear of God, this unjust judge, it was because of this woman who was driving him wild by coming again and again and again and again and again. And so she got justice. And Jesus goes on to say, you've got a loving father in heaven. If an unjust judge will give justice, how much more will your fa- how much more not will your father Got that right? How much more will your father? But as we saw, the whole passage is talking about prayer. And here, I would want to urge you to pray. To pray that God would raise up, that Christ would give to his church a voice. A voice with great power. A voice wherein the people of this world, whatever they might say about it, whatever they might want to do to that person, that they would have to sit up and take notice. Because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon them. And then fourthly and lastly. The fact that Christ gives gifts to his church. Should result in much praise from us to the giver. You know if you look through the hymn book. The thickest section in our hymn book, because they've all got headings, the Holy Scriptures, Resurrection, Union with Christ and so on. The thickest section in this hymn book is praise to Christ. Praise to Christ. And that's appropriate, isn't it? It should be praise to Christ. And we read in verse 9, what does he ascended mean? Except that he also Descended to the lower earthly regions. I mentioned earlier about advent calendars. When I was a boy I used to have an advent calendar each year. And I liked my advent calendar. And I got excited each day. And more and more excited each day as I opened the door to see what was inside. I don't think I've had chocolates in mine. But I'd open the door and I'd get more excited. Why was I getting excited? I was getting excited because Christmas was coming. And presents were going to come my way as a result. And that was all I was interested in. I was only interested in receiving things for myself. For consumption and for me to play with. Toys and chocolates. That's all I was interested in. And that's all Christmas meant to me. But when we come to this verse, what does he ascended me? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly region. This brings us to Christmas, doesn't it? This brings us to Christmas time. Where we think and we sometimes sing 
about the squalor. In fact, there's a, quite a modern uh, carol that says, um, from the squalor of a borrowed state. Squalor. We see in that squalor. We see in that stable, if indeed it was a stable, but certainly what the newborn babe Christ was laid in was something that was squalor. Something that was filthy. Because it was a feeding trough for animals. Our dog's bark is no better. Imagine having a baby and laying it to rest in a dog's bed or laying it to rest in, you've got a large dog, but laying it to rest in a dog's bowl. You wouldn't dream of such a thing. And that's not to suggest that Mary and Joseph were unkind, but it's all that they had. Thou was rich, beyond all splendour, all for love's sake, when he became his poor. And he became his man, didn't he? And so we see amid the squalor, in that feeding trough, the Son of God. He who made the universe. He, if you remember a few weeks ago, I was preaching about independence and how no one's truly independent except God Almighty. And Jesus Christ was independent because he's the Son of God. He was truly independent. Didn't need anyone, didn't need anything. And yet for us, he made himself dependent. He was dependent upon his mother. A sinner, just like you and I, highly favoured of God. But a sinner, just like you and I. He was dependent on her. And as he grew, he was dependent on his so-called earthly father. To bring in the money, as it were. So that he could eat. So that he could be clothed. So that he could have a roof over his head. And ultimately, he, the second person of the Godhead, was dependent upon the first and the third person of the Godhead. He was dependent on his Father. On God the Father. He was dependent on God the Holy Spirit. All the while, he was on this earth. Our Saviour took himself to the lowest, to the lower earthly regions, descended he, in order to raise us to the highest. He ascended on high, and we ascend with him. And even though you're here now in the flesh, if you're in Christ today, there's a sense in which you are already ascended with him. But you have that sure and certain hope not hope with your fingers crossed, but that certainty that even though you're in the flesh now, when he returns or he calls you home, you will win your way. You will ascend literally to. He raises us to the highest. But it begins here. He doesn't wait for that day. He doesn't wait till eternity. He begins here to transform us. He begins here to make us into a people, into a body that resemble him in Christ's likeness. So he gives to us out of the riches of his glory, out of the riches of his glorious grace, but not only that, because of his victory, because of his coming into this world as a man, because of his becoming dependent, because of his living this life here, because of his offering himself on the cross, the trophies that he ring, wins as a consequence of that. He transforms that into gifting us here, apportioning grace to each one of us, giving us gifts such as officers, as it were, those raised up in the church to serve us, so that we could all be built up now and come to a maturity. The whole measure of the fullness of Christ, before we read about the fullness of God, the field to the measure of all the fullness of God in chapter 3 here, to the full measure of Christ. And that process is happening here and now. 
He washes us. He makes us new. He sets us in a church. He apportions grace to us. But now he distributes the trophies of his victory. And he raises through that each and every one of us for works of service. And I close by simply saying, Hallelujah. What a saviour. Amen.